Thank you for listening to Draw Near with Fred and Kara. And I'm back with another shorty this week with a whole lot of scripture. Today within the calendar of the Catholic Church, we are celebrating the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So it seemed pretty fitting to me to do some kind of learning or teaching about this. So today, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 8th, it's a holy day of obligation, which when the church has these days where we are quote, obligated. That is the word the church uses. But I feel like I want to say this because I feel like sometimes when we have these days where we're obligated to go to mass, I feel like that word comes with a certain connotation. And it almost makes us in our mind just maybe, maybe for some of us go, we're being forced or I have to go to mass. Um, But holy days of obligation and Sundays It's not the church wanting to force us to do things or to to make us feel guilty or rushed in the midst of a busy day to get to Mass. The church has instituted these days because there are profound moments in our history of the faith or key beliefs that we want to celebrate, and we do that with Mass. So she does this, and she asks us to come to Mass and make some Holy Days of Obligations Because she wants us to come to her and rest. Rest. Not rush, not stress, but rest. And we do this most fully through Christ. All right? So today, what God did for us and what we are called to come and remember and rest in and celebrate was pave the way for Christ to enter the world and our lives. Very fitting for Advent. (laughs) So today is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Honestly, I always thought that this was about Jesus because Jesus was miraculously conceived. So I thought Immaculate Conception was about Jesus. Even when the readings at Mass uh, growing up, they were always about Mary. And I was like, hmm, they didn't really talk about Jesus being conceived. That's super weird. Um, But I didn't really learn what the Immaculate Conception was and that it was about Mary until I was in college believe it or not. But hopefully this episode can help anyone who might not know either, um, or anyone who is curious about the Catholic faith or about Mary. So the Immaculate Conception pertains, just to kind of give you a glimpse, I'm not going to go fully into it yet, but the Immaculate Conception pertains to Mary and her conception in the womb of her mother, Saint Anne. So Mary, at the moment of her conception, at the moment of entering into this world, was preserved from all stain of original sin, all right? So I'm not going to explain that yet because before going into that and what kind of all of that means, there might be some people, um, maybe non-Catholic listeners or even Catholics who just haven't had the opportunity to really get to know Mary um, or had an opportunity to study her. And may not know what all of this means. So I actually want to start before getting into specifically the Immaculate Conception. I want to start by talking about why Mary? Who was this young virgin? Why her? Why is she so important? So we're going to get into scripture as always. So um, feel free to pause and grab your Bibles. So Mary is shown to be set apart. Mary is so instrumental in the story of salvation history. But Mary is shown to be set apart from the very beginning of creation. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this is often referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel or the first proclamation of the good news. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it's where God is speaking to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is actually today's first reading at Mass, is Genesis chapter 3. And there's a reason that it's in the readings. Because this comes in the context of Adam and Eve. So they had just committed the original sin. God gave them one commandment. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what do they do? They eat of the tree. So this is Adam and Eve's original sin. And within the context of receiving their just punishment from God, God gives this message in in Genesis 3.15. He gives them hope. It might not read that way, but that's what it is. In the midst of receiving this and being cast out of the garden, God gives hope because he's giving in this passage about the woman and her offspring crushing the head of the serpent, 
what he is doing is giving the promise of a savior. And the savior is going to come through the woman. So we see in the New Testament, we see who this woman is. So I'm going to jump to John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, and we get to see who this woman is. Oftentimes, the, this passage or this account of the wedding at Cana is referred to as the scripture passage where Jesus performs his first miracle and he begins his public ministry. And he does. Okay, this is, this is true about the passage. But I'm going to argue that although that is true, I think this passage is inherently Marian and intended to be Marian, okay? Marian meaning about Mary. So John chapter 2 begins by saying, There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. So I love this passage because it reminds me, um, Fred and I are really big Office fans. And this passage always reminds me of The Office. And it's the episode where Charles Minor is there and uh, David Wallace comes in and they're trying to argue like who should be in the meeting. And Charles goes, Dwight, come on. Oh, and um, Jim. And then Dwight goes, come along afterthought. This always reminds me of that. Not that Jesus is an afterthought. That's not at all what I mean. Because if it's a Marian passage, Mary, Mary's intention is always to point us to Christ. But I always love this because I think John wants to set up this passage as a Marian passage. It says the mother of Jesus was there. Oh, and Jesus and his disciples, they were there too. All right. But this passage is where Mary goes to Jesus and intercedes for on behalf of the wedding couple because they are out of wine. And this is a pretty big deal. All right, I'm not going to get into all of the little things because I honestly think the wedding at Cana could be its own shorty or its own episode, so I'm going to skip over some things. But she goes and she wants to intercede for this couple, and she says, they have no wine. And Jesus' response to her is, Oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Sometimes this can be read as a rebuke, and I don't mean that it's being accurately read as a rebuke. I mean, sometimes it's easy for us now in, uh, you know, in our culture and how we would read that to be like, oh, woman, what, what have you to do with me? You know, my hour has not come almost like it's, it's like he's scolding her. This is not what's happening here. That's not at all what's happening here. Actually, what is happening here when he says, oh, woman, is that he is telling us who Mary is. She's the woman from Genesis 3 chapter 15. That's what he is doing. If you don't buy that, (laughs) read through all of John. Start with chapter 1. There are themes beginning in John's gospel that are very similar to Genesis. Like it goes, it goes through different passages and it'll start different sections leading up to um, John 2 that'll say the first day, the next day, the next day, the next day. So okay, that was four times. We're on day four. And then when it gets to chapter two in the wedding at Cana, it says three days later. So first, there are similarities to the creation account because the creation account goes and the next day and the next day. And then three days later from day four, if you're following me, (laughs) in John's gospel, we have four the next days. And then, and then the wedding at Cana starts three days later. What's four plus three? Day seven. So day seven in Genesis It's like the pinnacle of creation. It's it's the day that the Lord says everything is good and he rests and he blesses that day. So John here is setting up this account, the wedding at Cana, a Marian passage to reflect Genesis like it's a new Sabbath day. It's important. (laughs) And it does relate to Genesis. All right. And a better translation, a more accurate translation, um, rather than what have you to do with me, would be what would you have me do? My hour has not yet come. That doesn't sound like a rebuke to me. Woman, what would you have me do? My hour has not yet come. What that sounds like to me is Jesus saying, woman, the one from Genesis that birthed me, the offspring that would crush Satan's head. That's who I am, Jesus. What should I do here? Because my hour has not yet come. The hour that is a reoccurring theme in John's gospel that refers to the cross. The hour that's going to lead to the sword piercing Mary's soul. 
that Simeon tells her in the temple in Luke's gospel. Yeah, that hour. That hasn't yet come. It's not time, mom. So what would you like me to do? Because if I do this, the path that leads to the cross is going to start today. That's what's happening in this passage. Jesus is inviting his mother to begin his ministry before the time. There's a deeper lesson in her response that I I think is probably more fitting for a future episode. But the point for today of that passage is that Jesus is pointing out that Mary is the woman who is set aside for all of time. The one foretold of at the time of creation that would bring about the Savior. And now in this account, the one who begins his public ministry, his path to the cross. So this is reiterated in John's gospel again at that hour in John 19. So at the foot of the cross, the hour spoken of in John chapter 2, the hour that Mary gave permission to start. This happens in John 19, 27. Jesus is on the cross and it says that he sees his mother and the disciple he loved standing near. And Jesus said, woman, behold your son. Again, pointing out that she is the woman from Genesis chapter 3, who is going to crush the head of Satan. And how does she do that? By offering herself, by being a part of God's plan for salvation, by giving of her body to bring God into the world. She is the woman. And obviously the offspring is, of course, Jesus. But in this scene in John's gospel, Jesus gives all of us to Mary as her offspring. Okay, I'm going to explain that. Jesus gives all of us to Mary as her offspring because it says, woman, behold your son. So John, the the apostle John, is the one standing at the foot of the cross. He is the, the one that Jesus is talking about when he says, woman, behold your son. He's talking about John. And John is also the author of this gospel. But he doesn't say, John does not write, Jesus said this to his mother and me. He says, Jesus says to his disciple whom he loved. Okay, so... This is purely opinion of Kara. This is not scripturally based. I'm not going to point to scripture, but I think there's a reason that he does this. I think that John intentionally keeps this general because I think he wants us to place ourselves in this account. We are the disciples at the foot of the cross. We are the disciple he loves. We are the beloved son or daughter of God, the father, through our baptism We are the brother and sister of Christ, and we are the spiritual children of Mary, the mother of God. And if we want to be beloved disciples of Jesus, we must see Mary in this way as our mother, just like John, the beloved disciple. Okay, getting a little sidetracked here. I really love Mary and scripture passages. But the point of all that (laughs) was to show you that throughout scripture, Mary is set aside Mary is the one that God planned to work in to enter the world, to bring Christ into the world. And we see this throughout the Old and New Testament. Like in in Isaiah chapter 7, um, in verse 14, it talks about Mary. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Already talking about Mary as the virgin. So at the Annunciation, this isn't, the feast is not about the Annunciation, so I'm not going to get into this. But when it says, you know, the angel appeared to a virgin, people would have remembered Isaiah chapter 7. So this was very important. So Mary was always the plan. And of course, if Mary was always the plan from the very beginning of creation, God would work in her life from the moment she entered this world, from the moment of her conception. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit deeper now into the Immaculate Conception and kind of where this dogma comes from. Dogma meaning um, it's a true teaching of the faith given by God through divine revelation. So the Immaculate Conception is one of four Marian dogmas, and it means that Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother without original sin. So before kind of explaining that a little bit more, what is original sin? So original sin has has two meanings, and I already kind of mentioned one, but the very first sin of the world was committed by Adam and Eve, and we, t- we call that original sin. So when they first disobeyed God and ate the fruit. But original sin can also describe the fallen state of human nature. We are all fallen. 
all of us. We all are inclined to sin. This fallen state that all of us are in is called original sin and it affects every single person born into the world. All right, so this kind of dual definition of original sin comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's in the glossary, but it's also in scripture. (laughs) We see this in the world and we see it in scripture. Um, I can see it in my own heart. I am naturally inclined to sin. There are many things that I do that I'm like, why did I do that? I think all of us can look at our culture today and we see this within the world. But we also see it in scripture. So Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, he says, I do not do what I want, but I do that very thing that I hate. Why? Why does he do that? Because he is fallen. We are all fallen people because of original sin. And the only thing that can help us to avoid sin is grace. There is further evidence of original sin, and we see this in Romans chapter 5. So I'm going to read it very briefly, but it's starting in verse 12. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. Okay, so death and sin came into the world by one man. Who's the one man? Adam. And it says, it spread to all men, because all men sinned. Not just talking about men here. It's talking about humanity. It's talking about all mankind. Well, we were not all alive when Adam was alive. But scripture tells us because of Adam's one sin, all men sinned. So we have this fallen nature. All right. And I'm going to jump to verse 18. It says, Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. We were made sinners by Adam. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Because of Adam and Eve, all of us are conceived. We enter this world with sin, with a fallen nature, in a state of original sin. We are, as this, this passage says, we are made sinners. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, we will be, notice future tense, we will be made righteous. How are we made righteous? How are we forgiven of our sins and of this original sin? For us in the church, it's through baptism. It's through baptism. One of the fruits of baptism is to cleanse us of sin. Oftentimes in the Catholic church, We do baptisms for babies, for infants. Well, if one of the fruits is to cleanse us of sin, what sins could infants possibly have? Original sin. Because all of us are born in the state of original sin. All of us have this fallen nature. But baptism brings the life of God. It brings the Holy Spirit. It brings the the grace of Christ into our hearts by washing away the stain of the sin of Adam and Eve. So through Christ, we are made righteous. But Mary did not need baptism. Mary was saved from original sin from the moment of her coming into being. She always, always had God's grace. She always had the divine life living within her. Okay. So we can see this in today's gospel reading for mass. Perfect place to turn. (laughs) So it's in Luke chapter one. I'm only going to read a very brief part, but it's from Luke chapter 1, which is the Annunciation. So the angel, it says that in the sixth month, referring to um, Elizabeth's pregnancy, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. So that's all I'm going to read from the Annunciation, because for the sake of discussing her immaculate conception, that is what we need. The angel comes to her and says, Hail, full of grace. So the word here, hail, The Greek word can mean also mean rejoice. The way that the angel speaks to her 
he doesn't call her Mary. I know our, as Catholics, our prayer is Hail Mary, but he says, Hail, full of grace. Like that is her title. Her name to the angel is full of grace, right? So th- this is why Mary was troubled, all right? We see in the, the passage just previous to this, Zechariah was troubled and he questioned God and there were consequences to that and he couldn't speak for nine months. He was mute for nine months. This is not the same kind of being troubled. Mary is troubled because it says she pondered what sort of greeting this was. Hail, full of grace. He greets her with a title. And the Greek word here for full of grace, the Greek word that, that is used here in scripture is kekari tomine. Maybe I'll put that in the show notes if, if you're a visual person, you want to see it, but kekari tomine. All right, St. Jerome. St. Jerome is um, one of the primary people um, who translated the Bible to Latin, but he uses specifically uses the phrase full of grace. I know some of our English translations will say, you know, rejoice, which the word does mean rejoice, hail, but they can say rejoice, highly favored one. But Jerome, St. Jerome specifically says full of grace. Why would he do this? Well, because this Greek word kekari tomine, the root of this word is charis. C-H-A-R-I-S is charis. And this Greek word charis means grace. The root word of her title is grace. So this word has never before been, been used in scripture at this point. Never. Origen, he's one of the early Christian theologians. He says that this is the only place in all of scripture where this word appears. And Mary is the only person that this word kikari tomine is applied to. This is why Mary is troubled. Okay, Mary is troubled because she did not know this word. Mary was troubled because she did not know this word. She knew the writings of scripture. Mary was very familiar with scripture. How do we know Mary was familiar with scripture? Well, because throughout scripture, it says Mary pondered these things in her heart. She was a pondering meditative woman. And we can even look at her Magnificat that she gives with Elizabeth. Her Magnificat sounds a whole lot like Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Mary knew this prayer of Hannah. So who's Hannah? Well, really quickly, Hannah praises God because she has this son, Samuel, who she had been praying for and who she never thought she would have because she was a barren woman. Mary, a perpetual virgin, never having been with a man, resembles this prayer, praising God for a son she never thought she would have. Mary knew the scriptures but she didn't know this word because it's nowhere else in scripture. So Origen says that if Mary had known of someone else who had been addressed with these words, she would not have been troubled. It's not to say that full of grace doesn't appear elsewhere. We see this with Stephen in the book of Acts where he is called full of grace, but it's never addressed to him like a title and it's never the word kikari tomine. Okay, so Mary is told she is full of grace with this word. And going a little bit further, this Greek word is a perfect passive participle. So this indicates that Mary was perfectly filled with grace and had always been filled with grace. She had always been filled with grace. So the word, uh, remember I said charis is the word grace. There's another word that has charis as, as the root. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, um, where it says, um, I think it's verse 5 through 7. It says, he freely bestowed on us the forgiveness of our trespasses. But the word here, it could be translated, he freely graced on us. He freely graced because the root of that word, um, ekaritosin, the root is kari, so it means graced. So he freely graced on us the forgiveness of our trespasses, found in Ephesians 1. So what is grace? To be forgiven. Grace is to be forgiven. And this is where the church gets the Immaculate Conception. Mary was conceived immaculately in that she was graced or forgiven of original sin at the first moment of her existence. 
Mary was conceived and born without original sin, which would make sense, which would make sense from what we just got from Romans, because I already showed you that all men are made sinners through Adam. It's like it's genetic. Okay, it's handed on. We are all sinners because of Adam and it's passed on to all humans. But Mary, the bearer of God in her womb is without this stain. So the stain is not passed on to Christ. Because God chooses to enter into this world as a human being. So that doesn't change our past history of salvation. It doesn't change Adam's sin. There is still this genetic, this genetic handing on of original sin. So God has a plan in all of this and he preserves Mary and Jesus is sinless. There is a difference. There's a difference between Mary and Jesus because Jesus is sinless because he's divine. Jesus is perfect because he is God. Mary is sinless because God chooses to preserve her. It's not of her own accord, but it's because Jesus, her son, who she will bear, won this grace on the cross through his sacrifice. So his sacrifice is outside of time. And the grace that he won on the cross is applied to Mary at the moment of her conception. Hopefully all of this really gives you a new light to what we are celebrating today and who we are honoring today in Mary and in her immaculate conception. But we also started Advent recently. And admittedly, again, I didn't really have familiarity with um, liturgical seasons, but Advent is a time of preparation, a time where we can look forward to the coming of Christ and we prepare ourselves and our hearts and our lives for the coming of Christ. And Mary was the avenue of this. God chose to enter the world. God chose to take the form of a slave. We see this in, in Philippians in chapter 2, verse 7. Um, God emptied himself. We call this the kenosis. We call this scripture passage the kenosis or the self-emptying. God emptied himself, taking the form of a slave being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. How did this happen? How did God empty himself, taking the form of slave through a simple poor woman? Mary was the avenue that God used to come into this world, to empty himself for you out of love. So today and within this time of Advent, I want to encourage you to spend some time with the Holy Family to grow closer to Mary, grow closer to Joseph, and reflect on what it is that we are preparing for and look forward to in the coming of Christ. There are three ways that Jesus enters the world. Christmas, Jesus is born into this world. We prepare for the second coming of Christ because he will come again, and we await the second coming of Christ. And the third is that Jesus every single day enters into our lives and our hearts. He wants to. Every single day, Jesus wants to enter into our lives and into our hearts. So this Advent, I just challenge you to reflect on all of those things and to truly prepare yourself and your heart for this Advent and this Christmas season and give Jesus time to enter into your lives every single day.